So we're here to talk about activism, but specifically I'm here to talk about the activism, uh, activism related to climate change specifically, because that's what I do fundamentally, and it, I think, puts the whole activism discussion into a, an interesting focus. So to start off, um, what's the point? Well, there's a number of different points. There's a point to this talk specifically, why I'm here. Um, I mean, first of all, I hope it's understandable somewhat. If it's not, well, then we're <laughs> I'm in trouble. Um, it's, you know, part of the point is to allow me to meet people, to hear other people's ideas, to increase the likelihood ultimately of people engaging in activism, particularly the redshift climate change. That's one of my points for being here. It's to have fun, because if we're not having fun, again, why are we here? Um, and it's to add a psychological perspective to how people think about activism. So I have a variety of different points for being here and for giving this talk in the first place. What's the point of activism, though? Well, activism ha has a number of points, too. And <clears throat> different people would find different of these points to be more or less important. But for example, one of the key uh, purposes of activism historically has been to simply raise awareness with the assumption being that if you raise awareness then things will change whether that's because if you you know speak truth to power power structures will change as we have very optimistically believed for quite some time um, or at the very least if you speak truth to people that they will change once they know what the right thing to do um, is so raising awareness educating the public letting people know again what the issues are uh, but ultimately the point of activism is to change behavior Right? and to create political pressure. Because if people's behavior doesn't, doesn't change, or don't change, if their behaviors don't change, and if the political system doesn't change, if the top-down drivers themselves don't change, then activism is kind of spinning its wheels and not um, achieving a whole lot. So in other words, act the point of activism might be thought of to be, um, a couple of points, to be to inform and to inspire, right? to give people information and to motivate them, so to educate them and to motivate them. These are two different purposes, though. One is a little more of a mental purpose, a mind purpose, education, information, and one is a little more of a heart purpose, right? A feeling purpose, to motivate people, to make them want to do something and ultimately to do it. And the fact that these aren't the same is one of the biggest points I want to make today. <coughs> education and motivation are not at all the same thing and in fact have remarkably little to do um, with each other. Another way to think about the point of activism is that it's to increase the number of people that are involved in activism. Right? Because from a perspective of having things change, the more people that are involved in the change or transformative process, the more likely it is to change, the more power you will have. So part of the purpose of, acti of activism is to grow itself. And then as it grows, of course, these things um, become easier to achieve. We are talking about climate change activism specifically, and I do want to make the point that the global situation, our knowledge of the global situation, has changed quite a bit in just the last couple of years. Uh, and this changes our discussion of activism substantially. Um, so for, specifically, if we were to look into the future and think about what worlds are sort of possible, right? You can have the you know nasty world that nobody wants to live in, the happy, sustainable world that everybody wants to live in, and then some relative, you know, somewhat degraded world somewhere in the middle that we're probably going to live in. Um, historically, environmentalism, anyways, and environmental activism was of the sort of, you know, optimistic and sparkly variety, where we thought that even though the world was sort of going in the wrong direction, we would be able to turn things around and get back to the happy, sustainable world that we all want to live in. So traditional environmentalism was quite optimistic. Current environmentalism a little more grim recognizing that we live in a somewhat degraded world, and regardless of what we do, that's going to sort of continue. But it's a lot better than um, catastrophe environmentalism, <laughs> which oh talks about the world going up in flames, um, and giving us a variety of different scenarios whereby you know things spiral out of control. And obviously, you want to stay as far away from the red line and as close to the green line as possible. So the discussion is how to keep things from sort of spiraling out of control and to stay closer to the green line. Now, as of just a few years ago, it was still reasonable to talk about this green line, or at least, you know, this healthy, relatively healthy area here, um, up until a few years ago. Specifically, if you're talking about climate change, the big driver is carbon dioxide, and the thinking of the time up until about 2007 was that as long as we could limit the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to about 450 parts per million, then things would be okay. We could keep things in a relatively degraded world and not spiral out of control. Um, now, when the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, announced this and, and published this uh, result, this is a fairly major point. Uh, they're talking about 450 parts per million CO2 
We're at about 390 right now. We go up two per year, it's 30 years, right? So that's achieving something along the lines of halting the, in, you know, the fossil fuel-based industrial system in about 30 years, which is a fairly enormous undertaking. Um, however, a couple years ago, or within the last few years, we have discovered, there are scientists, I should say, that study these things have discovered that 450 is probably too optimistic and, in fact, puts us up into the catastrophe environmentalism, environmentalism scenario that we don't really want to be in. And instead, the true sort of tipping point or maximum sort of safety threshold is somewhere around 350 parts per million carbon dioxide concentration and quite likely less than that, but it's a pretty good place to start. So this comes from James Hansen, who's the director for um, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies under NASA and a variety of other collaborators that publish with him, um, saying that 350 is what we need to get to, but of course, you know, you are here at 390. 350 we passed sometime around when I was still in high school, um, quite a long time ago. So we've been above what is considered to be the safe threshold point. What this suggests, according to Dr. Hansen and his collaborators especially, is that this 30-year turn the industrial system around sort of scenario that we thought was challenging is nowhere near challenging enough compared to reality. So he, uh, they published a, an article in a journal of atmospheric sciences called um, Where Should Humanity Aim? And their point is simply, not to get confused by these graphs, but the point is simply, if you think about carbon dioxide emissions, which is what this shows, over time, and you think about turning society around, then you're like, oh, okay, so we're going up and up and up and up, and we can massively uh, invest in renewable resources, and maybe nuclear deserves a second life, or maybe not, depending on your perspective, and whatever the case may be, we can achieve great gains in energy efficiency and conservation, et cetera, et cetera, and we should be able to turn the world around. Right? It's just a, it's just a matter of when we do this, and how aggressively we put these policies in, into place. And if your mental model of the world is like this, and of the climate system is like this, then that's okay. That's still a fairly optimistic scenario, but that seems achievable. I can see this line going up, and then I can see it coming back down. But if you think about the fact that carbon dioxide persists in the atmosphere for quite some time, then it, it, the graph looks up a completely different shape. So instead of looking at carbon dioxide emissions, if you look at carbon dioxide concentration, then regardless of which, which one of these curves you look at, the point of this, the, the most important point, is that even if we stop completely 100% what we're doing right now, there's still a certain lag time in the atmosphere, right? As well as, I mean, other, other uh, parts of the climate system as well. But the point is that this is not just a quick turnaround. Um, in fact, if, you know, even some of their very, very uh, optimistic scenarios, which is what, that we cut coal basically immediately and cut most fossil fuels basically immediately, increase massively our restoration of critical ecosystems and figure out how to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, even if we do that, we're going to be over the window for a number of decades at, at, at the very least, and possibly you know, a century or more. And if business as usual scenarios, we're over the, <laughs> you know, the um, limit for hundreds of years, basically. Um, that changes things. It's a very simple you know, piece of information that you could miss, the fact that CO2 stays up in the atmosphere for quite a long time. And if it does, then any scenario that, that involves turning things around has to incorporate that lag time into our understanding of reality. So a whole bunch of words here, I'm not going to read too many of them to you, but Dr. Hansen says that our initial objective of reducing atmospheric CO2 should be 350 parts per million, which should be ingested as we learn more, basically. Um, he says, although a case already could be made that the eventual target probably needs to be lower, the 350 parts per million target is sufficient to qualitatively change the discussion and drive fundamental changes in energy policy. Right? So they don't know what the precise final number is, but if we can get to 350, we've done an awfully good job, and the, the um, efforts to do so are, are basically what we need to be uh, talking about. So whether it's 350 or 340 or 302, it doesn't really matter. We have to start heading in that um, direction. It goes on to say, a rising price on carbon emissions and payment for carbon sequestration is surely needed to make a drawdown of airborne CO2 